Drum roll. Now you're alive and we're going to say hello to the McKinney element that is watching us live right now. Give a rousing round. Wingman, how are you doing? What an honor to be with you guys today. I am delighted to be here. Chad, thank you for the privilege and the opportunity that you've given me today. I am uh, so impressed with what Wingman does. So impressed with the commitment that you've made to each other, that you've made to your families, that you've made to the kingdom of God, and that you've made to this ministry, I think this needs to happen across the nation. I really do. I think this is a movement of God, and I believe that Chad Henning is anointed by God to lead this movement. I do have a selfish question to ask, because you've kept in pretty good shape after your playing career. Can you play cornerback? <laughs> We're in need. The uh, need is great. And uh, we could have the conversation after. In fact, can any of you play cornerback? Anybody available have that conversation? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the chance to be here. And I pray that what you've given me to say and what you say through me now would be used by your Holy Spirit in such a way that when we're done, we will each of us have heard that word that was your intention for us, your purpose for us, that gift from you specifically to meet the need of our heart and our lives in this day and in this hour. Father, I submit all of this to you. I step to the side. I ask your Holy Spirit to be the teacher and the speaker of this moment and of this time, as I thank you, God, for these men and the privilege of being their brother and their partner in Christ. Now, Father, we submit all this to you. It's on your altar. It's in your hands. Use this time as you wish, as we give it to you with gratitude. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, as Chad said, we have a ministry that exists to kind of connect faith and culture, engaging contemporary issues with biblical truth. We especially are interested in empowering men. That's why being in this kind of a setting is a privilege for me, because that's what I do for a living. I try to pay attention to what's happening in the news across the week. There were some odd things that happened in the news this week. You may or may not have seen. Stephen Hawking, for instance, was in the news again. Not only the world's foremost physicist, but uh, an individual, let's see, there we go, but an individual They are a complete mystery to me. When the world's foremost mind thinks women are a complete mystery, I'm encouraged. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I feel better just having, uh, having heard that. I do need to go on record uh, today in making it clear that the sweater vest I'm wearing today is not an endorsement of Rick Santorum. <laughs> the White House, but his sweater vests have been a uh, clothing phenomenon. Have you been seeing this? They have their own Facebook page. They have their own Twitter feed. There's even a YouTube video about Rick Santorum's sweater vest entitled to, let's see, sleeves slow me down, something <laughs> like that. It's been a strange week in the news. A friend sent me the other day something that uh, caused me to understand churches are not immune from oddities. These are actual statements in church newsletters captured recently. Low self-esteem support group will meet Thursday at 7 p.m. Please use the back door. <laughs> the pastor will preach his farewell message after which the choir will sing, break forth into joy. <laughs> Remember in prayer the many who are sick of our church. <laughs> I was a pastor a long time. We had a lot of folks who uh, would have qualified. Eight new choir robes are currently needed due to the, the addition of several new members and the deterioration of some older ones. <laughs> you hate it when that happens, you know? I understand that. For those of you who have children and don't know it, we have a nursery downstairs. <laughs> I've never had a question about that myself. I've, I've always been clear on that. Weight Watchers will meet at 7 p.m. at First Presbyterian Church. Please use the large double door at the side entrance. 
That's just not right. That is neither right nor fair. The New Testament opens with some odd news, with some strangeness. You wouldn't expect as you're opening the Gospel of Matthew to find this gripping, remarkable narrative. Book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon. Aren't you gripped? Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse, Jesse the father of King David. It's a thrilling narrative, isn't it? It goes on, David the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam the father of Abijah, Abijah the father of Asa, Asa the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat the father of Jehoram, Jehoram the father of Uzziah, Uzziah the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz. And on and on and on and on the story goes. And you're thinking, why is this how the New Testament begins? It's actually one of my favorite passages in Scripture. And it's a text that I believe applies especially to men today. I need to unpack that and explain why I think that's true at the start of this year. I was a pastor for 25 years. I've been teaching men's groups across most of those years. Been counseling men all across my ministry. I have found one common denominator in every context, in every setting, with every guy I've ever talked to. All of us are struggling with self-image issues. All of us. I've never found an exception, have a sense of inadequacy, a sense that we're not really the people we wish we were, that we're not really the people we want you to think we are, that we do what psychologists call an idealized self. We get in a setting and we figure out who we wish we were and who we want you to think we are, and then we pretend to be that person. I'm doing that. I'm tempted to do that right now. I'm tempted here to make my first agenda impressing you, making you like me better so that I'll like myself better. I'm like you at that place. My father had his first heart attack when I was two years old. He died of a heart attack when I was in college. He was an amazing dad. I've never known a more moral person. It was so clear that he loved us. But because of his heart condition, because of his physical issues, there were things he just literally couldn't do. He couldn't teach me how to throw a football or catch a baseball or shoot a basketball. And so growing up, I got picked last for every athletic team. I made good grades in school, which didn't help where I grew up as a kid. My life changed in the seventh grade. I was put on the uh, offensive line, which is where they put the kids who couldn't do anything. That's back before left tackles made billions of dollars like they do today. Larry Montgomery fades back to pass. The ball gets tipped in the air, and I caught it. Ran for a touchdown. Found out I could catch a football. I was made a receiver. Eventually was made the quarterback. Found out I had athletic ability. When I was in high school, I actually wanted to play tennis for a living. This was back, anyone remember wooden rackets? Bjorn Borg, you know, <laughs> cat gut for strings, all of that. Dinosaurs roaming the earth and all of that. Well, I found out I could do things I didn't know I could do, but by that time, the tapes were already in place. This sense of inferiority, of inadequacy, that if you really knew who I am, you wouldn't probably like me very much, was already there. A psychologist wrote a book that really struck me recently. The title was, Why Am I Afraid to Show You Who I Really Am? Do you sense that? Is there stuff inside you you're glad we don't know? Are there parts of your life you really want to keep secret? Is there a sense inside you that you're just not who you hoped that you would be. I'm 53. I'm learning that the ladder, in some ways, as I'm trying to climb it, is leaning against the wrong wall, and life is not what I at one time hoped it would be, and I'm never going to be president, and I'm never going to play for the Cowboys, and I'm never going to be who I hoped I would be. And there are things in me that are disappointments and frustrations and inadequacies, and every guy I know has all these issues inside him as well. Well, that's where our text comes to bear. Jesus was the only child in all of human history who got to choose the circumstances of his birth. Did you choose where you would be born or to whom you would be born? Did you have anything to do with the circumstances of your birth and your origins? Jesus did. The only child to choose the place where he was born. 
I was born in Houston, Texas. I got to grow up in Texas, got to be born in Texas. I pity those people who have that bumper sticker that says, I wasn't born in Texas, but I got there as soon as I could, you know. So glad I don't have to wear that. So glad to be a native Texan. It um, is, uh, for all of us, our circumstances, something that we had absolutely nothing to do with. But Jesus doesn't fit that. He chose to be born in Bethlehem. Today, the city has about 30,000 in it. outside Jerusalem, if you could choose to be born any place, would you be born in some thriving metropolis, in some major city? Jesus chose to be born in a village you would never have seen or even thought of visiting on your way down to Jerusalem. If you were to choose the specific circumstances of your birth, would you choose a hospital in a sanitary condition with the latest technology? Jesus chose a feed trough in a cow stall in a cave. Here's the Church of the Nativity. It's uh, built over the place where Jesus was born, we believe, according to reliable tradition. A cave behind the place where the stable and the inn in Bethlehem were originally located. This is the oldest church in all of Christian history. It goes back to the 4th century. The door that uh, my friend Treva Mahan is walking through there, it's called the Door of Humility. You have to stoop down to get inside. It was built that way back in the 12th century because marauders on horseback would ride into the church and steal from the people, and so they built this low doorway. It's an appropriate way to come into the place where Jesus was born. Once you stoop through the door and come inside, you find a cathedral inside, a remarkable place. On the right, you can see something of what it looks like. It's jointly uh, officiated by Roman Catholics, Greek Orthodox, and Arminians. Toward the very front, on the image on the right, as you can see, is a worship center, a kind of a platform and a stage. You make your way around the stage to the right, and you go down some steps. And when you do, you find yourself in the cave underneath the Church of the Nativity. To your right, in the top left there, is what's known as the Star of Bethlehem. That's the place where Jesus came into the world. The bottom left shows you the location where his manger was located. It wasn't a lovely wooden crib, it was a stone feed trough. Joseph would shove out whatever the animals were eating and it was there that the Son of God was placed. That's where he chose to be born. If you could have chosen the first people to attend your birth, would you have invited celebrities and business leaders, political leaders, athletes? Jesus chose shepherds, field hands, rough, grimy Blue-collar workers who were not allowed into a synagogue because they couldn't keep the rituals of their religion. Weren't allowed to testify in a court of law because they were considered to be liars. You couldn't buy from a shepherd because they were thought to be thieves. That's who Jesus invited to the place of his birth. Jesus was the only baby to choose his ancestors. And that takes us to the genealogy. As it begins, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. That's shocking. Jewish genealogies never included women. It's the only one we know of that includes women. In fact, it has four women in Jesus' genealogy. So Matthew is going to include women, something nobody else ever did. His PR agent would suggest that he would select women like Sarah or Rachel or Rebecca, women of matriarchal status and societal significance. Instead, the first woman in Jesus' genealogy, the first ancestor on a female side included in Jesus' family tree is Tamar. All the Jewish readers knew her story. Back in Genesis 38... Judah's oldest son was married to Tamar, but he died. As was the tradition of their culture, Judah then married his second son to Tamar, but the second son soon passed away as well. Judah had one more son. He was too young to be married. He promised this son to Tamar when he came of meritable age, but when the son grew up, Judah refused to give his son to Tamar, apparently afraid that he might die as well. Leaving Tamar completely bereft, with no family, with no support, uh, ostracized from her society and culture. So Tamar dressed herself as a prostitute. She seduced her father-in-law, Judah. 
She became pregnant by her father-in-law. She had twin sons. Their names were Perez and Zerah. Jesus was the only baby to choose his ancestors, and he chose the children of an incestuous relationship for his family tree. To make a point that flawed families are welcome in the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter to God nearly so much where you've been as it does where you're going. All of us have a Tamar in our families, don't we? I do. We have stories in my family tree I'd rather you not know today. You have some. If you're like most of us, you're struggling at some place in your family today. There are issues in your marriage or with your kids or with your parents. You're dealing with some stuff today inside you and inside what's happening in your family. And there are places where you're just not what you thought you would be. And the enemy comes along to make you think that you're somehow inadequate and inferior and God can't really use you because of all of that, because of those stories and because of that shame, because of that guilt that you carry around, because of the struggles inside your past and your family. Some of you have been through divorce. Divorce is a living death. It's one of the hardest things for guys to get past and begin to get a sense of redemption about, especially if there's the guilt that almost always comes with. And there's the enemy to come along and say, if you couldn't handle a marriage, how could you be used by God in any other way? Some of you are dealing with kids that are disappointing you or with parents that are struggling. And it's all the time with you. And you're here today and someone asks you how you were when you came in. And you said you were great. And you ask them how they were and they said they were great. And you lied to each other and then you came on into wingmen and sat down. But in the back of your mind right now, there's the stuff waiting for you when you leave and your family's in the center of that, and you're wondering if God can use you. If God could use Tamar, God can use you. It's not ability, it's availability with God that counts. Then you keep reading in the genealogy, and you find that Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Rahab, the prostitute? Rahab. Matthew didn't have to say that. Jews didn't include women in their genealogies, as I said. Points it out. Make sure you know it. The Rahab, the Canaanite, pagan prostitute, was part of Jesus' family tree. Then you keep on reading. And you find that David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Matthew can't bring himself even to give us the name of Bathsheba in Jesus' family tree to prove to us that flawed families and failed lives are no exemption to the Spirit of God. And the stuff in your past doesn't have to determine your future. I am convinced that God redeems all he allows, that God uses for greater good everything he permits or causes. He is still on his throne. He works through all things for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. There is nothing about your past that will keep God from using you today or tomorrow if you're willing to be used. If Rahab and Bathsheba could be in Jesus' family tree, you're welcome in the family of God. Scripture is blunt when in 1 John 1, 9 we read that if you confess your sin to God, he's faithful and just to forgive you for your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. The Bible says that when we confess our sin to God, he separates our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. He buries our sins in the depths of the deepest sea and he remembers it no more. I love that. He remembers your sins no more. The next time you confess a sin you've already confessed, God doesn't know what you're talking about. John Claypool was one of my favorite communicators. He had a story about a priest who had committed a terrible sin back in seminary. He confessed that to God, but the guilt was with him every day. One day, a woman came to him with the strange announcement that God had begun speaking to her audibly. The priest was understandably dubious. He suggested to the woman as a test, the next time she was with the Lord and they were speaking with each other, that she ask God what sin her priest committed back in seminary. The woman said she would. 
The next week she came in for her appointment. The priest asked her if in her prayer time with God she had asked the Lord what sin he had committed back in seminary. She said she did. The priest asked the woman, and what did God say in response? The woman smiled and said, God said to me, I don't remember. Guilt is not of God. All across Jesus' earthly ministry, he was more than willing to point out sin. He never condemned sinners. There is no sin outside his grace and no life outside his use. And if Rahab and Bathsheba can be in the family tree of Jesus, you're welcome. It's not ability, it's availability that counts with God. And then we continue to read down the genealogy, and we have all these famous names, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon, and so forth. And then we find nine names in the genealogy found nowhere else in Scripture. We don't know the first thing about them. And then last we come to Mary, the mother of Jesus. The Jews taught their daughters from a very early age to pray every night that they might be mother of the Messiah. But everybody knew that the Messiah, the chosen one, the anointed one who would come and redeem the people as the messenger and the leader from God would be born in Jerusalem to the high priest family or would grow up in the, uh, in the member of the Sanhedrin, would be part of some well-known, wealthy, sophisticated family of status. Mary was a peasant teenage girl living in a town so small it's not mentioned even a single time in all the Old Testament. God chose her to prove that forgotten people are part of the family of God. Mother Teresa said loneliness is the great epidemic in Western culture. In what way do you feel forgotten, unappreciated, underutilized? Where is it in your life? Do you have this sense that others have passed by and you're on the side? And your capacities and abilities and the things that you've tried to do and the things you've accomplished really aren't known and that your life hasn't become what you dreamed it would be. And there's this sense inside of you of inferiority and inadequacy and this sense that perhaps God can't use you the way you dreamed he would, but that's not true. That's a lie. That's the enemy. Because forgotten people are part of the family of God. It's not ability. It's availability. But before I'm done, I have to say to you, there's a catch. Jesus can lead only those who will follow. Jesus can be used. A surgeon can't help you if you won't have surgery. A pilot can't get you to your destination if you won't get on the plane. Self-sufficiency is the great heresy of our culture. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Look out for number one. Pull your own strings. You can do it are the heresies of our day. When Jesus launched his public ministry, he announced, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus taught us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. When he comes back, his name will be king of kings and lord of lords. In the Bible, God is a king. In our culture, God's a hobby. In the Bible, God is king on Friday morning, just like Sunday morning. In the Bible, God is king of every minute of every day. If you were living in a kingdom today, you'd be sitting in the king's chairs, wearing the king's clothes, breathing the king's air, wouldn't you? If you were living in a kingdom, then the king would be king of every part of the realm, king of what you do in private, not just in public, king of what you do online late at night. King of what you think, not just what you say. King of every part of us. Well, in our culture, God's a hobby for Sunday, not a king for Monday. We get that from the ancient Greeks who put their gods at the top of Mount Olympus and the gods are up there and we're down here and we have a transactional relationship with these gods. Place a sacrifice on the altar so the gods will bless your crops. Go to church on Sunday so God will bless you on Monday. Come to Wingman on Friday so God will bless you the rest of the week. Pray so that God will guide you. Give money so God will bless your money. Start your day with a quiet time so God will bless your day. Transactional religion. Spiritual, secular. Sunday, Monday, religion, real world. 
God a part of your life, God a genie in a bottle, God a means to your end. God's looking for kingdom Christians today. Men who will decide that Jesus is Lord of all if he is Lord at all. Men who will decide that he is king of every dimension of your life. Because he can only bless what he can touch. He can only lead what will follow. He can only use you if you are willing to be used. It does not matter to God if you have a flawed family or a failure in your past or if you feel forgotten. God knows you. He knows every hair on your head. He knows everything about you and he loves you and he likes you and his son died for you and he can't wait to use your life. One of my favorite verses in Scripture is Isaiah 38, verse 18, where God says that He longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. God is crazy about you. You can't imagine what God wants to do with your life. He has a good, pleasing, and perfect will for you. He has a plan to prosper you and not harm you and give you hope and a future. But He has to be king of all that. Because He can lead only if you'll follow and bless only what He can touch. Today's your day, at the start of this new year, to decide if God is your hobby or God is your king. If you're sold out or if you're a sellout. If you're submitted or if you're playing. If he is king or if he is not. Let me introduce you to two heroes and I'm done. Two men who prove that God will use anybody willing to be used and that your past is no indicator of your future. Two examples. I'd like to introduce you to Carlos Alamino. I've already prayed for Carlos today. That's Carlos and his wife Soledad outside their home in Cespedes, Cuba. Carlos played third base on the Cuban national baseball team. In Cuba, the national baseball team is the Dallas Cowboys, New York Yankees, Los Angeles Lakers all rolled up into one. And he was a starting third baseman. He gave that up to become a Baptist minister in a tiny village in the center of Cuba. I've been to Cuba seven times. Every time I'm there I see New Testament Christianity. There have been a million new Christians in Cuba in the last ten years. God is doing a spiritual awakening on the island of Cuba. And Carlos Alamino is at the heart of it. The church he pastors, Redeemer Baptist Church in Cespedes, Cuba, has 200 in it on a good day. Carlos, last year, through his evangelistic ministry, led 68,000 people to Christ. through evangelistic crusades. He's still a rock star in Cuba. And through an underground seminary. An illegal underground seminary. It was my privilege to officiate at one of the graduation ceremonies for his seminary a couple years ago. They had 700 graduates that particular year. About 100 of them were at this particular occasion where I was asked to lead. You can't graduate from Carlos Seminary until you have won to Christ and discipled ten people. I used to teach at Southwestern Seminary back in the 80s. I wonder how many of our students would graduate under those conditions. Cuba does everything they can to get Carlos to leave. Made it almost impossible for him to build his house, for him to build his church building. They persecute him wherever he goes. He has followed every place he goes. When I email Carlos, I have to know that the Cuban authorities are watching. I never go down there to preach or go down there to share. I'm not praying for him, I'm thinking about him. It's code language. Carlos would be the pastor of one of the largest mega churches in the United States if he would ever agree to come here. But he loves Cuba. And last year 68,000 people came into the kingdom because his life belongs to God. Because no matter his circumstances, he knows God will use anybody willing to be used. Because your past doesn't determine your future. And it's not ability, but availability. Closer to home, let me introduce you to another hero of mine. Lives here in Dallas, a man named Abraham Sarker. If you've not heard of Abraham, if you've not had him speak, I would encourage you to consider him. Abraham grew up in Bangladesh. 
He was the disciple of his village imam. So advanced in Islam that he was given the great honor of being sent to the United States as a missionary to America for Islam. Assigned to a college campus in Orlando, Florida. That's one of the four ways that Islam is growing in the United States, is by sending missionaries to be college students on our campuses. They're there to take classes, but they're really there to win our children and grandchildren to Islam. Abraham was one of those. Before he left his village in Bangladesh, he had a vision of himself in hell. And then Abraham, as he was praying in the mosque before leaving, heard the words, read the Bible, like you're hearing my voice. He'd never seen a Bible. So when he came to Orlando, he went to the librarian there at the university that he had been assigned to attend to ask for a Bible. She didn't know where one was. She sent him down the street to the Baptist student ministries because they might have a Bible. One would hope they would have a Bible. He came and he asked for a Bible. He explained where he was from. They found him a New Testament translated by William Carey into his native Bengali language. Who has a Bengali Bible lying around on the shelf? <laughs> Reading the New Testament, talking to Christians, Abraham became a believer. His father, who was the leader of the jihadist party back in his village in Bangladesh, placed a warrant for his arrest if he ever returned home. Years passed. Through email and telephone, Abraham led two of his brothers to Christ. He met and married Amy, who's amazing. Then the time came when Abraham and Amy felt convicted by God that they were to go back to Bangladesh and talk to Abraham's parents about the Lord. His father said he would drop the warrant if Abraham would come home, but Abraham didn't know if he really did that or if the officials would agree to drop the warrant. When I was in Bangladesh last January, Abraham was telling me the story how he and Amy were coming through customs and Amy's in this line over here where the non-Bengalis are and Abraham's in this line over here and he hands the official his passport and Amy doesn't know if she will ever see Abraham again. If he will be arrested, if he will be exiled, they have no idea what will happen. The officials allow him in. He led his father to Christ. He led his mother to Christ and the rest of his family to Christ. He established a ministry in Bangladesh that in the last two years has led 2,000 Muslims to Christ. If Abraham were here today speaking to you, he would say to you, your past is no indicator of your future. And it's not ability, it's availability. God is looking for kingdom Christians. For men who will start their year by making God their king. And so I've come today to challenge you to do that. To close, I want to invite you to consider a statement which is so profound that I have it taped in the back of my preaching Bible. It's by Watchman Nee, great Chinese theologian, martyr. Watchman Nee made this statement. Consider these words. A day must come in our lives, as definite as the day of our conversion, when we give up all right to ourselves and submit to the absolute lordship of Jesus Christ. There must be a day when, without reservation, we surrender everything to him, ourselves, our families, our possessions, our business, and our time. All we are and have becomes his, to be held henceforth entirely at his disposal. From that day on, we are no longer our masters, but only stewards. Not until the lordship of Jesus Christ is a settled thing in our hearts can the Holy Spirit really operate effectively in us. He cannot direct our lives until all control of them is committed to Him. If we do not give Him absolute authority in our lives, He can be present, but He cannot be powerful. The power of the Spirit is stayed. A day must come in our lives, as definite as the day of our conversion, when we give up all right to ourselves and submit to the absolute Lordship of Jesus Christ. Is today that day for you? If you ask Jesus to forgive your sin and be your Lord, you are a child of God. No matter your family or your past or your forgotten present, you're loved and you belong to God. You don't have to make that decision again. But every single day you have to decide if the one who is your Savior will be your King. Every single day. You start the day by submitting that day to God as King. You place your life on His altar as a living sacrifice. You decide, I am crucified with Christ. You decide today, you are King of my life today. There's only room for one person on the throne of your heart. It's either you or it's Jesus.
If you have not put Jesus on the throne of your heart today, then you are on the throne. The default position is you. You are a fallen person in a fallen world. You are on the throne unless you have consciously, intentionally put Jesus there. Have you made him the king of your life yet today? Have you made him the king of your finances and the king of your job and the king of your family and the king of your problems and the king of your hang-ups and the king of your struggles and your temptations and your guilt and your fears? Have you done that? Would you do that with me today? Would you place your life on his altar as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God as your spiritual act of worship? Would you decide today, as you're starting this new year, that your life is going to belong to him as your king? And it's not ability, but availability. Would you decide that? And then tomorrow, would you place him on the throne of your heart as your king tomorrow? And would you do that Sunday? And would you do that next Thursday? And would you do that in March? And would you do that in November? And when you have a decision, would you make him king of it? And when you face a temptation, would you make him king of it? And when you struggle with a problem, would you make him king of it? Would you decide to live a surrendered life to God as your king? If you will, then guys, this will be the most empowered, anointed, blessed year of your life. It is no coincidence that God called me to be here today. And no coincidence that this week he put this message on my heart. This was not what I was planning to say. I am convinced that we are in the midst of a divine appointment, you and me. And that right now, this morning, could be one of the most important moments of our lives. If we would, in this moment, decide we will be kingdom Christians. And that this moment, we will put him on the throne as king of all. So I'd like to lead you in a prayer to do that. I want to encourage you and challenge you to do that with me. And then to make this your commitment tomorrow and on Tuesday. And as you walk through this day, and you face a decision or a temptation or an opportunity or a problem, as you walk through this day, you're putting him in charge of this day. If you will, you will experience the power of the God who created the universe in a way you may never have experienced God before. So let's pray together. Would you bow your head and your heart with me before God? Take this moment, just you and the Lord. This is just you and God. This is not about me. This is not about the guys at your right and left. This is not about where you're going next. Don't allow the enemy to bring any of that into your mind. Don't allow the enemy to bring to you any distraction right now, anything that would keep you from this moment and this decision. We're only going to be here a minute longer. Decide that this minute belongs to God. And right now, I challenge you, I encourage you to come to God with me in this act of submission and prayer. Say to God in your own way, Dear God, I make you the king of my life. Say that in your heart to God right now. God, I make you the king of my life. I place my life on your altar. I submit my life fully and completely to you. Every part of my life belongs to you. Use me however you will. Whatever it takes, whatever the cost, whatever you ask. I am a kingdom Christian. I make this my commitment to you. In the name of the King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for your support of Wingman Ministries. We would love to hear your comments about today's show and help you get connected with other men in your local area. To keep up to date on...
upcoming events, element groups, and speakers, please visit our website at wingman.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for our email list.